hope everybody's doing well. And um, it's, uh, I guess, in America, it's Super Bowl Sunday. So uh, how many are going to watch the game today? How many hands? A few people? How many people just don't care? And, yeah, they're, okay, yeah, that's a, <laughs> yeah, that's, I'm not sure who won that vote, you know. But, uh, Chuck, the Steelers are not in the Super Bowl. That's still your team. Kendall, I like it. Now the, the Patriots are in the Super Bowl, so I see who that you're. I see who you're rooting for today. So well, whether you watch the game or uh, watch the Crown on uh, PBS or another movie, enjoy your day. Uh, welcome to those our guests that have been uh, visiting with us or here today for the first time. I uh, really would like to get to know you better and let you know some great things uh, about Fairview. So. You'll notice, pick up that little color uh, brochure or that color worship folder in the back, and you will see on there the end of the month, the 24th, on Sunday after our 11 o'clock service, we're going to have a welcome to Fairview lunch. And uh, want to, if you're new to Fairview, a new member, a guest, come down and join us for a nice lunch, meet our pastoral staff, and we want to let you know all the great ways you can be involved here at church because uh, uh, we are a very active church in missions and helping our community. We want you to get involved in that. Uh, like um, Alan said, we had the blood drive here yesterday, 38 units of blood. So that was wonderful, surpassed our goal. We have the soup a bowl. Uh, we'll do soup a bowl, that sounds better. <clears throat> That's today at noon. And uh, if you hadn't been to that, that's a lot of fun. You have all kinds of different soups and chilies, grilled cheese, and we raise money for uh, feeding our homeless in the area. So I encourage you to, uh, to be involved in that as well. Well, I think it's a great winter to be uh, starting to uh, come to Fairview or uh, our membership. What we're looking at is really uh, what it means to be a member of the body of Christ, what it means to be a member of a church, what it means to belong. And we are, are all looking and reading, uh, if you haven't gotten a copy, of I Am a Church Member by Tom Rainer. And it's been a good study, and we're doing that on Sunday mornings. So to catch you up, we began by saying if you love Jesus, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, then the Bible says um, you are a member of the church, which is the body of Christ. You really, we really don't have a choice. Sometimes we think we do, but you're a member of Jesus' body that needs to be working in his world for his ministry. Uh, then last week we talked about in order for that to happen, we've got to be one. We've got to be unified. We've got to all come together with the same goal, uh, with, with the same spirit. Uh, and we've got not just unified doesn't mean just to get along, but we need to be uh, really like Jesus prayed for us. We need to be one as Jesus and the Father and the Spirit are one. And this week, the message about church membership is really about Church is not about your own preferences and your own desires. And of all of the topics that we'll do over the next couple of weeks, this may be the most challenging. This may be the most challenging one for us to look in the mirror at ourselves about. You know, not making relationships that we're in and not making memberships that we're in and even not making the church we go to and belong to about us, not focusing on us and what we get out of it, just goes against human nature, doesn't it? It's just not what we feel like we need to do. Because I think from the time we were born and raised in our culture, we're raised to be number one. We're we really believe, a lot of us, that the world revolves around us. We 
are taught that we actually think sometimes, some of us, that no one else has an idea or no one else knows how to do things as well as we do. And we're going to let people know about it. Now, the difficulty with this kind of thinking as it relates to being a part of the body of Jesus Christ and a member of a local church working together and and being one is that it's the opposite of what the Bible says. And there's no way we can live like that and think like that and behave like that and be a functioning body of Jesus Christ, especially here at Fairview. The New Testament clearly points out, now get ready for this, as maybe a different way of thinking, church membership is not about you. Church membership is not about you. It's about Jesus. It's about the song we just sang, the heart of worship. It's not about us. It's not about our preferences. It's not about our desires. It's about Jesus Christ and worshiping him and living for him. Uh, but don't feel bad. Even those, even those closest to Jesus would, would get this mixed up. If you look back in the 10th chapter of Mark, James and John, his closest disciples that had lived with him, ate with him, slept with him, heard his teaching, saw the miracles, heard him talk about being a servant leader. They're walking along the road one day, and all of a sudden they ask Jesus the question, okay, Jesus, who's going to be the greatest in your kingdom? I think it should be us, us two brothers. They even got mixed up in listening to Christ and his word, and somehow they thought Jesus' coming was all about them. So it's just in our nature, and maybe that's why it's one of the most difficult lessons uh, to get our minds wrapped around. But as last week we looked at what Jesus said in the Gospel of John, kind of, deeper theologically to why we need to be unified. Paul talks about being unified. A big part of that is, is not seeking our own desires in the body, in the group of believers we're with. Now, he does this in Philippians. So turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them, if you desire to, to Philippians. It's over in the New Testament. And um, it's a little book. It's uh, often called the, uh, uh, a letter that Paul wrote, a letter of joy. He loves this church at Philippi uh, so much. It's one of the prison letters. Paul is writing this letter to this church as he sits in a Roman prison, never to get out. He will soon be executed by Caesar's orders very soon. But... He hears about some struggles at Philippi, and he wants to let them know that he's there with them, praying for them, encouraging them. And in the second chapter, he really connects unity, oneness, with very practically how to do it. And that's what we want to look at this morning. So first of all, let's look at Philippians chapter 2, and let me read the... Um, the first uh, five verses. Paul says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the spirit and of one mind. Can you hear Paul begging, imploring this church to be one? You know, if you love Jesus at all, make, you know, make my joy complete by coming together as one mind, as coming together with one purpose. And then he starts to get practical here. Here's the tough part, verse 3, beginning there. <clears throat> Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. 
in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. But he tells us what actions to take to be one, to have unity, to not let our own selfish desires get in the way. But they're pretty tough things, aren't they? Do you ever struggle? Do nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit. <laughs> Do you ever struggle with that one? Just in, in your relationships that you have with your family or your spouse or your mom and dad or your good friends? Rather, in humility, now value others above yourselves. Do you live life that way? Do you value others above yourselves? Is that how we've been taught? And then not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Wow, that's pretty radical teaching. Do you think we need a little bit of that at our churches? Do you think we need a little bit of that in our country? Do you think we need a little bit of that in the world? <clears throat> but it's not how we think, is it? So how do we do that? So, so G, uh, Paul goes on, and once again, as, as mysteriously but logically, we've seen each week when we're talking about how to be a good church member, he uses Jesus as our ultimate example. How do we get there? How do we get that mindset? How do we think of others first? He says, have the same mind of Christ Jesus. And then the rest of this passage that we're going to look at today, he tells us what Jesus did and how he was a servant. And let's get a little practical how we can put that in our own life. So, then, beginning there with verse 6, he's talking about Jesus. He says, use the example of Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Now, if anyone that's ever lived on the face of the earth in all of history could really claim to be superior to everybody else, if anyone could take advantage of the, the, their privilege and where they began and their hierarchy, and if anyone could think of their own desires and comfort before others, it was Jesus, right? He, the Son of God, who emptied himself, who was at the right hand of God before the creation of the world, as Jesus told us last week. And he came down but he came down in human form, and Paul, in this beautiful uh, ancient hymn, comes down and he takes on the very nature of being a servant, not a Lord. So who in the form of God did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited? So what can we think about? Well, we, we can remind ourselves, yes, because we have Jesus and we've accepted Christ in our hearts, if you've done that, you're saved for all eternity. That's true. You're saved for eternity. Yes, you've, uh, at some point in your life, you had to humble yourself and confess your sin. And you also know that there are others out there who haven't done that. But you accepting Christ as Savior, you being a forgiven sinner, that does not make you better than anyone else. Doing that does not mean that you're better than any other unbeliever or believer. And that you shouldn't use your salvation to exploit and emotionally manipulate other relationships in your life by holding that over other people's heads. You're, we are all here in the same boat, aren't we? We're forgiven sinners who mess up, but we have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Paul says a part of, the first part of, uh, of getting that, uh, not wanting our expectations and our desires in the church we're at, is to realize that, that we're all the same. Second, Paul says this, as a, as a son or a daughter of Jesus Christ, 
take the form of a slave with others. He goes on in the next verse and says, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. So how do we live out this mind of Christ? Well, we live out a forgiven life in gratitude by serving others. That's one way. We are so grateful for the grace of Jesus Christ. We're so grateful for how Jesus has saved us and changed us and given us hope that we spend the rest of our lives in thankfulness and gratitude in serving others, knowing we can never pay back Jesus for what he's done, but we sure can try. We can resist having to be right all the time because of what Christ has done for us. Are you like that? Do you ever feel like you've got to be right all the time? We can judge less and forgive more because that's what God has chosen to do with us. We don't get what we deserve, do we? We get salvation. We can search out and and discover a ministry that we can get involved with to people who are less fortunate than we are, and we can love them without expecting anything in return. That's living a life of gratitude in what Jesus has done for us. So I encourage you, and one of the practical things is seek out a person, seek out a group of people. Seek out a race. Seek out someone you don't agree with. Seek out a person that right now you would say, I don't like, and find a way to serve them in the name of Jesus. And you'll begin living out how Christ wants you to be in his body, the church. It's not an easy task, is it? Third, to do that, in using Jesus' example, we have to humble ourselves. Jesus, he says there in the end of 7 and the beginning of verse 8, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Even death on a cross. Jesus humbled himself so much that and wanted to obey God the Father so much. He did that even to the extreme of dying on the cross to save the world from their sins. That's amazing. That's humility. So how can we live out this humility and have that mind of Christ? Here's a few things. Talk less and listen more. That's good advice, isn't it? Especially in church and community you're at and your family. Whenever. Talk less and listen more. Second, seek first to understand and then be understood. I see this all the time. People want to come in and, and let me know. They want, I want you to understand me. <laughs> or maybe you're, you know, you've had a relationship like that with somebody else. You need to understand where I'm coming from. My position's the most important. Instead of first trying to understand where another person is. That's an approach I try to take. You know, if someone's coming in to really talk about something or upset about something, I always say the first thing I want to do is I want to understand perfectly where you're coming from. Stephen Covey years ago told a great story. I may have told it before. He said uh, uh, he was on the subway in a big city, and there was a, uh, uh, obviously a dad there with two kids. And the subway was fairly crowded, and the, oblivious to the dad, these kids were running all over the subway. You know how kids can be. They were uh, stepping on toes, they were, you know, getting in people's faces and business and, and uh, talking loud, sometimes crying on this trip, throwing a tantrum, the dad just sat and did nothing. 
like he didn't even notice. And Stephen said, I couldn't take it any longer. Don't you always want to say something? And Stephen said, I finally said, sir, don't you see your kids, you know, are, are kind of out of control here a little bit? You think they could sit up with you? And he kind of woke him up, this man out of a fog. And the guy said, I'm sorry. He said, I'm sorry, sir. We're, he said, we're just coming from the hospital. And my wife, who's had cancer for two years, just died. And, and, and I'm just thinking about that and what in the world I'm going to do next. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. You know, rejoice at other people's successes. Can you do that? Can you rejoice at other people's victories and successes? I guess the opposite of that is being jealous <laughs> and covet. Um, you know, I, you know when, when especially a church family is unified and and a, and a church family is not worried about their own desires because we begin to champion new visions and new ideas, even if it's a different way. Looking to do things Jesus' way and not our way promotes creativity. It uh, promotes innovation. It, it promotes us being able to see where God's working and join him. And then maybe one of the humblest things of all is find a new believer and help disciple him or her in the way of Jesus. They're not going to know the Bible maybe as well as you or pray as deeply as you, but can you walk alongside them and help them grow? And lastly, in this beautiful hymn, is know that living out the life of Jesus as a servant, know that there's a great reward. Paul gives us Jesus' reward, doesn't he? We're getting somewhere in verse 9 there. Therefore God also highly exalted him, Jesus, and gave him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father Paul reminds us that if we have the mind of Christ we live for him the faithful Christian our reward our greatest reward relies with us in glory in eternity in the eternity that we'll spend with Jesus our great day will be when we are able to bow at the feet of our Savior. Maybe I mean, our great day, wouldn't you love for Jesus to look at you and say, as he says in his gospel, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over just a few things. Now welcome, come into my kingdom and enjoy the eternity. So how do we describe someone who's becoming spiritually mature and, and thinking of others more than themselves? <clears throat> uh, Leonard Weedle says this. He says, a mature person does not take himself too seriously, keeps himself alert in mind, does not always view with alarm every adverse situation that arises, is too big to be little never feels too great to do little things, and is never too proud to do humble things, never accepts either successes or failure in themselves as permanent, is one who is able to control his or her impulses, is not afraid to make mistakes, has faith in themselves which becomes stronger as it's fortified by their faith in Jesus. That's living the servant life that Paul's talking about as Jesus as our example. 
That's living the life that doesn't seek out our preferences and our needs, but the need of the whole of body and the needs of our community and our nation and our world that we can meet. That's when we really come together as community of faith. You know, I, I guess it's uh, uh, divinely appointed that on this Sunday as we talk about, again, the deeper aspects of being one, that uh, we come and it's a communion Sunday. And communion comes from community, doesn't it? And uh, it means we, we do something together. In this case, we remember something together. And so in just a, a few minutes, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to take communion together. There's bread and there's, there's uh, juice at two stations. And come, and uh, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and here today, and just want to participate in community of faith, the church, and we, re- we come together to remember what Jesus did for us. The bread reminds us that he gave us his body, that he did go to the cross and take care of the sin problem. The blood reminds us that he, to do that, he had to give his life and shed his blood. But it also reminds us of the resurrection, that Jesus, in coming back from the dead, gave us the ultimate victory over our worst enemy that we, we, we never could conquer without him, death. And so we have eternal life. So come and remember by, by taking the body and the blood of Jesus and remembering what he did for you. And after we've had communion, you can come up to either side. You'll see myself. I'll be over here. and Willow will be over here. Brent's going to help. Tammy's going to help. And um, you come and take uh, Take the body and blood of Christ. Remember what he's done for you as we remember through communion. And then we'll sing a a closing song together. And if Christ has put upon your heart today that, that you need to do something, follow him in a special way, obey him, he's telling you to do something, you do that. You pray about that. He's asking you to ask him into your heart for the first time and become a believer. You come and talk to him. And uh, we'll take those next steps. Let's pray, and then we'll enter communion together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. And Lord, we know it all begins with you becoming a servant, humbling yourself to walk in our shoes, to show us how to live. But really, you came to rescue us from ourselves through the cross. You rescue us uh, through your death. You conquered sin. You conquered death. We now remember you through taking of this communion. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen.